Hello and welcome to episode number 236 of the Armin Show podcast. We are here today with the author of the book, The Mind is Flat, The Remarkable Shallowness of the Improvising Brain, Nick Chatter. Welcome to the show. How do you pronounce your last name? Uh, Chater. Chater. Oh, cool. Chater. That's wonderful. I never would have thought that. This is a wonderful thing. First thing I want to mention is, welcome to the show. Thank you. Second thing is, when I saw this book, it's, it immediately spoke to me because... It's not, it's, it's basically something I've been telling at least my close friends for a long time. I've had this idea towards what you're saying here. And it was nice to have exactly the concept that I believe in represented in a book. Before we get to the book, I always like to go through background. Mm. Take me through. I have a little bit of your biography here. You're at Warwick Business School. Uh, you had chairs in psychology at Warwick and UCL. Uh, you have numerous publications. I always like... I've, I've mentioned this in past episodes. Someone that's doing a lot in the category, that's where the skill comes from because you have a sense of all the main important things in that field. You can only get skill when you touch on everything and then you're the person. That's a wonderful thing. Various awards, associate editor for journals, cognitive science, psychological review, psychological science. That's a cool feature. And then uh, part of various societies. Where did you start your university experience and take me through it? Yeah, so, so I started as an undergraduate in mathematics at Cambridge University mm. in England, um, but I didn't last very long doing that. I really wanted to do um, philosophy and logic, um, mm -hmm. but it turned out to do very little logic, and I turned out to not be that interested in uh, the very abstract kind of mathematics you do uh, at, at any university, certainly at Cambridge. Um, so I switched into philosophy, uh, mm -hmm. I did my logic that way, uh, which I really enjoyed, and then as part of our uh, course, we had a um, an optional psychology module, uh, which I took, and that was fantastic. Uh, it was yeah. taught by a, a Cambridge psychologist, who I think is still teaching, called John Mollen, who in fact taught my daughter. My daughter's also also did the psychology, uh, oh. psychology at Cambridge. Um, bizarrely, he, uh, she had the same the same teacher, and he gave an incredibly inspiring um, course, particularly on perception. Uh, that has stuck very much with me, and that's very much part of the the book. So he introduced me to just how astonishingly interesting and counterintuitive and generally um, remarkable human perception is. So that took me into um, the general realm of, I guess, cognitive science. So thinking about the mind as a computational machine. Um, so I did my PhD at Edinburgh on that topic. And my interests in those days were quite varied. So I did experimental things on categorization, I did some uh, computational neural network stuff. So this is neural networks a long time ago. Um, mm -hmm. but it was terribly exciting in, in the uh, mid '80s. It was all very exciting. Wow. Nothing, nothing really worked quite worked like it does today. So they hadn't had the staggering breakthroughs that have happened in the last uh, you know, sort of 15 years or so. Um, and then beyond that, I mean, I started working in some mathematical and computational models of different aspects of cognition. Um, and as as time went by. I guess I started to um, both well struggle with the limit limitations of the approach that I'd started with. So I started with this very strong sort of rationalistic approach of thinking, and I do think basically you should try to understand the mind through reasons. You should try and think of the mind as a as a reason based um, system. It, it makes sense. It's intelligence is all about make, making sense of the world and trying to understand intelligence requires figuring out what sense we've made of the world. So I think. Thinking the the mind is a, a fundamentally rational is is appropriate, and very sensible. But the way one actually goes about that, if you come from a um, a sort of mathematical standpoint, is you think well either it's using some kind of logical principles, or maybe it's using some kind of um, Bayesian probabilistic principles, or maybe it's using some kind of combination of the two. And you start you start from the assumption that the system is coherent. So you think I've got a coherent model of the world here, I've got a coherent set of principles, a set of principles of reasoning, and I just have to turn the handle on my reasoning principles, given my coherent starting point, and I just figure out how the world works in a kind of methodical and algorithmic fashion. And I think that's a very attractive idea, but it just doesn't work. Um, and so the mind is flat is my kind of gradual realization that it doesn't work and trying to put forward a different perspective. So. From an intuitive point of view, um, I think the the standard view you get a lot in artificial intelligence, in economics, in lots of parts of psychology, is that, as I say, that we have a, a coherent model of reality, 
Um, it sort of makes sense. It might be wrong in some ways, but at least it's kind of internally coherent. Um, and we have a coherent sense of what we want. Again, we might want some strange things, but the idea is they're roughly speaking coherent. I mean, if I want, a, if I want apple, if I like apples more than bananas, and I like bananas more than um, cherries, then I must like apples more than cherries, and so on. You, there's internal sort of coherence, and you assume that coherence, and then you set off and try to model how we work. And as soon as you start to look at how the mind actually works, you realize, goodness, um, most of the time we have no idea what but our model of the world is, is absent. It's just got gaps everywhere. We just have no idea where we think objects are in the room if we're not right looking at them, even what is in visual space in areas that I haven't looked at in the last um, couple of hundred milliseconds. I'm just looking at the world through this tiny little, um, tiny little spotlight. And so the idea that I have a model even of the world in front of me is completely wrong. Um, and the idea that I have a model of, of my, my, my preferences or my life or anything complicated like that, I think is mistaken too. Um, and just to add one more thing to that, I think a metaphor I found, find, found extremely attractive, and I still do, is the idea that the mind is like a sort of mini scientist. This is an enticing but misleading idea, because it makes you think, oh, so the, what we should think of is that the mind has kind of theories of the world, a bit like scientific theories, and it's trying to prove them false and, then, and you know, replace them with better ones and so on. Um, and I think the whole idea that, 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 the thing about scientific theories when they're, um, at least when they're kind of clearly formulated, is they are co coherent. They kind of, they may be right or wrong, but they are kind of coherent, coherent um, systems of um, propositions, which is then you can try and you know, evaluate the consequences of. But the thing about the way we see the world is it's much, it's not coherent. Uh, we have just a scatter of different beliefs, a scatter of different preferences, and they do not fit together. And, and the brain is trying very hard to make them fit together. So it's not that we are relaxed about this. We want to make sense of the world, but the world is way too complicated for us to make sense of. Um, and it's our the, the 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 work of the brain isn't taking a model of the rea of reality and kind of updating it and adjusting it or a model of my, what I want and updating and adjusting. It's not it's not that. It's taking a, a kind of continual stream of concrete situations, concrete bits pieces of information, and thinking, what on earth do I do with this one? How does this fit in? And trying to wedge it into your thinking as well as you can. And then another one comes along and you think, oh my goodness, there's another one. I've got to do something with that. And always, and you're, you're always improvising from one moment to the next. You're struggling to deal with this new, new surprising piece of information. You're trying to weld them all together, but you you can never really do it. The, the, the system as a whole is, is always incoherent. So this is the point about the improvising brain, really. The, the idea is that the brain is continually improvising moment to moment. It's never, it never really re reaches a kind of, a, a, a model of reality or a model of itself um, and it never could the waste well too complicated for that so when we think about so the, 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 the just to finish by saying something about the, the metaphor the mind is flat so one of the things i think that's so seductive is thinking to oneself well you know i have these thoughts wandering through my mind moment by moment but yeah, you know, they're just a sample of just a vast stuff. There's all kinds of crazy stuff in there. There's all kinds of knowledge and thoughts and you know, things I've been probably thinking about without even knowing it for years. And you know, the idea that your brain is just kind of processing away and you only um, get a, a tiny glimpse of its 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 complexity. Now, I think in some sense that's right because your brain is is way more you know, it's hugely complicated and our phenomenological experience is very narrow. But the thing I think is very misleading is we tend to think. The stuff that we're not aware of, it's just like the stuff we are aware of, but 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 the, but, we, but it's just sort of hidden from us. And I think that's really, really misleading. The the experience of thinking, I would like this, or there's a there's a, a an orange in the distance, or um, any random thought you have. They, when you're thinking such a thought, that's the only thing your mind is able to to conjure up at that point. And it's not the case. It's completely wrong to think. Oh, that's just a sample of this vast, you know, vast, vast number of things my mind is containing. So the idea that underneath the surface of thought, I mean, let, me, let me start start that again. So I think you should think about the brain as continually improvising um, uh, its interpretation of sensory data. It, it, it's trying to understand what people have said. It's trying to generate things to say. It's trying to move around. It's dealing with one thing at a time in a very improvised way. And it's um, the idea that underneath that there's this kind of all kinds of hidden depths is 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 a, a, a complete a complete fiction, um, and the reason we have it I think is because we're such good improvisers. It's like it's like I'm telling you a story. Maybe I made it made up a world, 
and you ask me questions about the world. I say, oh, yeah, well, you asked me about that. And in fact, this happened. And you say, yeah, but what about that? And, I say, well, the, the, I, and of course, I'm making it up. Right? I, I, in that case, maybe I know I'm making it up. But if I make it up well enough, you can think, it's just like, you know, you've been there. There's a real world. You, you went to see this, this mystical land and you can tell me, tell, you're telling me all about it. And if I'm convincing enough, it'll fool you. And of course, we can we fool ourselves. We're such convincing explainers about our own minds that we, we kid ourselves. We fool ourselves. There's a, a whole um, sort of solid world in there, but actually we're inventing it. Mm. Yes. The, the main thing I first think about what you mentioned in the book is like a press reporter, sort of the secretary for some sort of a political figure. They just come up with things and many people think that's amazing. Oh, great. They just, it's always smooth and always, but... It really does look to be generated right at the moment continuously. Yeah. And yeah. there's not like a base underneath it of a logical foundation or something. It's just let's keep going, let's keep rolling. Yeah, is, that's right. Yes, I mean, the, the thinking about things like um, how we talk about things we, we obviously don't understand very well, like, is it like um, politics or the economy or you know, culture or something. These are things that you know, nobody understands. We just, we just clearly do not have a theory of these. Um, and yet, we can explain you know, why we like some movies and why we like some politicians and why we think some policies are going to work. And if you ask me more about it, I'll give you more stuff. And it can't be coming from kind of some underlying foundation. But of course, what it is often coming from is going back to this little point about improvisation is that I'm not improvisation, improvising from nothing here. I and mean, I've said I've had similar thoughts about other things in the past. So I can think, oh, yeah, this this is a movie. I think, well, this movie reminds me of that movie. And last time I said this, I'll say it again. Or I heard somebody else say something, something about this movie. You know, it's overly sentimental. I thought, oh, this movie reminds me of the, one of those overly sentimental movies. So the outcome's overly sentimental. And you know, or whatever it is. So I'm, I'm able to um, cook up a, 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 a sort of a, an explanation of what I think about something by piecing together things I've thought before and that I've heard other people think before. And I'm able to do that in a very creative and clever way. I mean, it's remarkable. It's an, it's an incredible feat of human intelligence that we can do this. But what it's not generated by is a kind of deep theory of, you know, what am I, what is the, for me, the, what, what is the mark of a great movie? You know, what's my theory of what a movie should be? Well, I don't have one of them, and neither does anybody else. There's so much that is made up. I used to have this concept that I had the stimulus response that so much of what we see is just, Stimulus comes in, person responds. It sounds like it's the thing that's based on their core, but with this information, it's sort of an instant, oh, okay, process, okay, that's the closest thing, probabilistically at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. So I think we, we the thing that stops us being completely stimulus-driven is, is, of course, we've got memory of past experiences, both uh, our own and by proxy other people's experiences when they've, spoken to us or we've seen, you've seen the max and so on um but but i think essentially that's right so what we are doing is we're we're being we're trying to assimilate every new situation to, to previous situations we're thinking ah i've been here before sort of it's a bit of a, bit of a blend of a and b and so i i will work, figure out a way to improvise my way through this situation based on what worked in the past so it's a very um yeah it's very it's very much driven by what's in your mind at the time which will partly be from coming from memory, partly from what's in, in the perceptual world in front of you. And um, and I think that's surprising how how far that is able to get us. I mean, we're, the, the thing is, we're incredibly creative improvisers. So it's not that it's not that we're like really superficial. We don't just look for some sort of superficial similarity between one situation and the next. We can think, um, for example, with um, in the book, I have various pictures of faces, which are these so-called found faces, which are pictures that, you know, like it's a, it's a door handle or it's a, it's a cheese grater or some other crazy thing. The world is full of these crazy um, non-face-like objects, but they, you look at them and you think, oh yeah, okay, that's the face and there's a nose and some eyes. Um, and, that, and that ability of ours to project um, from one type of one object to another in a very flexible, creative way is, is remarkable. Um, and I think that's what makes us so good at dealing with the plethora of new situations that arise. We can really, yeah, we can really cleverly reuse old stuff to understand new stuff. But what we're not doing is is consulting our sort of deep and true theory. That always a little bit something connected to that that always I don't want to say bugged me, but whenever I would do sort of improvising because I'm a very creative person, 
uh, I would create stories or scenarios and a lot of people would be very entertained and I, I used to do this a lot more. And then at some point I didn't really like doing it because I don't really believe in the, the press reporter just generates things from scratch. It's not based on a core. So I stopped doing it, but it's very likable. People are very attached to those kinds of stories and things. They go with it. There's no like, what's the base underneath it? They just go with it. So I, I noticed that um, as far as my creativity over the years, I switched how I put it out just because it kind of bugged me. The yeah, press but, but it's, it's interesting that the, um, you know, in a way, the, 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 the look, the sort of search, that sort of sense that there ought to be some foundation is actually some, in some ways an obstacle from a creative point of view. So, um, I mean, in, 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 I guess in a way, if you, if, you, if you start to think, for example, imagine you write a poem and if you think, yeah, but I mean, you know, I don't quite know, it sort of works, but I don't quite know quite what I'm getting at there. And some of these, you know, some of these words, are, I don't quite know why I put them and I don't, you know, I can't quite interpret it. Now, that's not, a, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, but on the other hand, if you if you completely you know, if you could completely parse and make sense of something you produced, it would be probably would be boring to you and, and other people too. But the thing is that what's what's really weird about create, creative the pre creative process is that people will produce stuff and think I don't know where that came from. I don't really know what that's about. And you're trying to interpret it just as much as anybody else is. Yeah. Uh, and if one has that sense that ah damn it there should be a foundation to this. Uh, yeah, I, obviously I, I'm kind of faking. I'm, 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 you know, I'm tricking people. Other other creative artists really do have a. You know, they know what their poems mean, or they understand the you know the um, the, the purpose of what their songs are about. But I don't quite understand my own. That you know that's 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 uh that's, you know you don't. I think you don't have to feel bad about that. I think it's it's probably just it's just the way it always is. Um, and similarly for a lot of artists, I mean, visual artists, at least many will who aren't working directly from nature will often produce things with no real idea where they're going. And they find some kind of pattern starts to emerge. Well, oh, okay, I'm going. I'm going with this one, and they produce something. And again, you have that. You, you, it, you can feel like it's um, either you can think that you, you, that it's a kind of wonderful mystical process where you're. I think it's also a complete fallacy being controlled by some. Um, a, you're almost as if you're almost possessed by some other being you don't understand. <laughs> I think my just somehow I produced this thing. I don't know how I did it, um, which is. Which I think is, which is one one way of doing it. Or, or you can feel like a, a slight fraud that you know I, you know, I just don't. You know, I somehow I've just cooked this thing up, but there's nothing really there. And I think, but in practice, I think we're always we're always in that position. Whether we're producing pieces of pieces of art or just chatting with each other, you know, we're always we're always floundering along. Uh, and the miracle is that we can do it so well because the world is really complicated. So we can't really have theories about it. We've got very little information about 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 it. We're seeing the world through a narrow perceptual window. Um, the world's always changing. The world's you know, way more complex than any physical theory can capture. We still cope remarkably well. Mm -hmm. That's cool. It makes that gives me a little insight on my own creativity. I didn't really think about, so I'm going to take that for myself. It's a good one. One thing you mentioned was class by John Mullen on perception. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. oh yes, I got stuck there. Yes. Yes. Um, well, um, two things I wanted to mention on that. One, I have past guest Mary Mullen. She's from Glasgow, Scotland. So that's kind of a cool right, thing. Right, so, excellent. And two, uh, what led you toward perception? What was it that you attached to that uh, yeah, you identified yeah. with? Yeah, it's very interesting because I, I mean, my, my main research over the years has not primarily been on perception. I've done occasional things. Um, uh, yeah, a reasonable amount, but not, it's not been my main theme. But it's always been my favorite thing. Really, I mean, I've always thought that was the thing that we understand in psychology. We really do. We don't understand perception, but we know lots of surprising things about perception, and they're pretty solidly known. Um, and I've always found that very beautiful. And the other thing I think that's very beautiful about perception is the fact that, uh, apart from the fact you can know things in a very sort of rigorous way, so you can know things like we can't detect color very. Uh, we can almost not. We're almost colorblind outside the um, uh, in the periphery. Of, Proof of our vision, and we can know that pretty certainly because there's no cone cells, and cone cells detect color, and there aren't any. Um, right. and for, they're very, very few. It's so you really different. know that. Yeah, you're looking through this tiny little window. In fact, most of your good color vision is in in an area of about one or two degrees of visual angle, or one degree, mm -hmm. most of it, and most of the detail too. And that's where there's a very, very dense pit of um, uh, of cone cells in this thing called the, the foveola, which is very small. 
Um, so we really, apart from the fact you can do experiments on this, you, behavioral experiments, you can just look at the anatomy and think, right, well, you know, kind of weird though it seems, um, it must be the case that although the world seems to me completely detailed and completely colorful, so I look around and you know, it's all there, every, I can see everything clearly, um, weirdly it's just got to be wrong, that's just got to be a mistake. So I think uh, that's amazingly attractive. But the other thing I think is, that is amazingly attractive is the fact that the th some of the many of the things we do know are very, very weird. I mean, like that, you know, like the fact that you have this sense of um, the, the richness of the world around you, which just must be wrong. Um, so you know things precisely and you know that they're very counterintuitive. And I think that's just extremely, extremely attractive. And I suppose one of the things that's always attracted me is thinking, how, how can we reconcile or how much can we learn, how much, we, how much can we take the really strange and counterintuitive insights that we have in perception where we're fairly sure of our ground and how far can we transfer those over to other things so understanding how we perceive emotions or how we make decisions or um how, you know these these how, how we reason these more complicated things which we don't understand so well and i think the kind of interesting it's kind of interesting that um it's never been at all obvious how you can make any kind of connection between between these because Perception seems astoundingly limited, um, and we seem to have an extremely thin grasp of the reality around us, though we have the impression we see everything. Um, but no one really, or at least, frequently, at least in many areas of um, psychology, um, people don't think, well, I guess maybe that's maybe that's true for everything. Maybe that's maybe that's just the general story. Uh, although some, there are certainly plenty of exceptions to that. Um, but but many but many of us have just thought well we'll just you know, we just assume there's this vast database and it's all completely sort of uh, well organized and rich and produces this kind of perfect theory blah 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 and you think well that's odd because you know if you take the parallel with perception um, that just you know that's just totally different and I think it's really a, you know I, I think um, if you'd go the other way and say well let's just assume let's, let's assume for a second that Perception is kind of the paradigmatic thing we do, which I think it's right, really, because the main the thing we primarily do is cope with the physical world around us in the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and you say, well, that's our primary job. Um, we have to string together perceptions. We have to string together actions. But our primary job is just coping with the flow of experience. We think that's the basic mode of operation of the mind and assume that everything follow that the basic principles of perception uh, carry over across the board, then you get a totally different picture and a picture that seems a lot more credible to me. Um, so, for example, um, it, we know from um, perception, as we were talking about, that you have this very narrow window through which you're looking at the world. And that's also true in other ways, too. So um, some very clever experiments by um, Huang and Pashler, um, then at UCSD, uh, have, have sort of lovely demonstrations of the fact that it appears we can only really process one color at a time in, in, a, in a specific sense, which seems extremely weird. Um, so if I if I sh if if you if you're shown a pattern a, a colored pattern and you have to pick out the shape of you know look, look, what 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 pattern do the blue squares make or the uh, the green squares or the or the yellow squares you can see that you can say yeah yeah the, the blue squares they make a little um, so you say you've got a grid with some squares of different colors and this is exactly the kind of thing that Huang and Pashler explored um, mm -hmm. you can say, oh the blue the blue ones make a little um, triangle or the uh, the green ones make an arrow shape. But in fact, you can only see one of these shapes at once. If you see one shape oh. one, as one colors, the other, the other, where where the other squares are, you've no idea. It's, you've, all you've got is uh, I see a blue triangle and some colored other colored shapes. Goodness knows how many there are, where they are. You just don't know. So you basically, your brain is seeing seeing a single color, a single pattern, um, and and the rest is, is is mysterious. Or an, another illustration of the same phenomenon is that. It's not just one color at a time or one pattern at a time. It's also one word at a time when we read. So you look at a page of text. You think, there's all this text. I can see it all. There's words everywhere. I'm, they're all flowing into me. And that's the illusion that can make you think you could potentially at least speed read. So you you, you, you try to run your eye down the um, down down the, the down the, the page. In theory, with speed reading, I think you're supposed to run it down. <laughs> and you have this sense that, it's all kind of going in, you know. I'm I'm kind of hoovering up these words, but it's completely wrong. Um, and so, wonderful experiments by um, originally Keith in Keith Rayner's lab um, when he was uh, at MIT before he went to, to UMass, and I think also then later UCSD. Um, okay. Now dead, sadly, remarkable, remarkable um, psychologist. Um, in in his lab, he just found that if you 
um, change the dis computer display when someone's looking at a, as a sentence so that they only see uh, a little word and, and, and a little bit around it. In fact, they see about 15 characters in total uh, as they move their eyes. So you make the, the text, normal text, where they are looking, a 15 character window, and everywhere else you just make, make it anything you like. Uh, vaguely, um, vaguely word-like. So you just you can replace all the letters with X's, and that's absolutely fine. So as the person looks around, reads the sentence, going usually from left to right, but they can go back if they want. Um, then they see um, the letters of the word they're looking at, but everything else is X's. Then they hop along to the next word, and they see lots of X's else, elsewhere. Now the funny thing is that if you were looking over their shoulder, you'd think, "Wow, that's weird." There's a little bunch of letters coming in and out of existence, and everything else is X's, and that, that bunch of letters is hopping along the page. But the person themselves just reads normally. They just think, they don't think anything weird's going on. They just read completely fine. And if you say, well, isn't it a bit weird having all those X's? They'll say, what X's? Can't see any X's? <laughs> and of course, if they look for the X's, as soon as they look for them, they're not there anymore, because wherever they look, letters appear. So as you hunt around, then the, the, the letters suddenly magically appear. Now, that's really cool because it shows you, and this is true for other visual stimuli as well. So it's if you were hunting around for, um, if you had a bunch of objects on the screen, and you were trying to search for a particular kind of object, then you'd have this, you could do the same trick. You can, um, you can just repeat, just put the things, put the objects, uh, say it was faces, I had a big, big array of faces on the screen. And you said, you know, look, look for, uh, see if you can see your friend in that uh, set of faces. Then when you weren't looking, for every face you weren't looking at, if you blurred the face a lot, so it just looked like a sort of blurry blob, um, that, would, that would be fine. That would be fine. You'd never notice anything. Um, because as long as you're looking at a face, then then you need to have the detail. When you're not looking at a face, you can't tell. But you have a, but you have the sense that you're seeing all these faces or you're seeing all these words simultaneously. And that's completely wrong. And I think that's a really deep insight. It gives you a really deep insight into the mind. This is, exact, this is in, in many ways, the key transfer from perception to uh, the mind at large in the mind is flat so the perceptual in insight is aha uh -huh. the thing is when i see the world as detailed what i mean is when i ask myself a question about it I, the answer is right there so if i say what's that word over there then suddenly i put a look flip my eyes over i know what the word is if i say what's that color i can check that color now because i can do that so fast as soon as i make a query i can answer it and that gives me the impression that, oh, it was sort of, I had it already there. It wasn't just that I got it quickly, I got the answer quickly. I, I had it already in my head. And that's wrong. We know it's wrong because the, before we had blurry faces or we had Xs, they just really, well, it wasn't there, right? But you didn't see that. You had not, not, not got it loaded in your mind, but you had the feeling that you did. Now, of course, that's just as possible when I ask you or you ask me about um, why I believe something or... Um, you know, to justify, you know, to justify some, some, some proposition or to tell, tell you why I liked something or didn't like something, um, I will come up with an answer. And you might probe that answer, going back, to, just going back to our creativity discussion again, and I will creatively say, oh, yeah, well, the reason for that was this. And then you'll ask me something else. And I'm producing, I will start producing all kinds of stuff. And because we're so good at this, we have the sense that, well, I knew, I, I thought that already. I didn't just, I didn't just think of it. it was, as soon as you asked me the question, out came the answer. <laughs> And of course, that's the that's the that's the wondrous sort of trick of the of the brain. So you have this sense that it's all at my fingertips, and the reason it's all at your fingertips is actually because you're a good improviser. But you think it's because you're it's all there already. So so another just finished with another analogy. Um, so it's a bit like you're standing in front of an enormous bank of fridges. And you know how in fridges, famously, the thing about the fridges is that the light is off all the time in the fridge. But every time you open the fridge, of course, the light goes on. Um, so now it's like you, you, you're looking in these fridges and you're just thinking, yeah, they keep telling me the lights aren't on in these fridges, but I can tell you they are. Look, here's, the, here's one. And I looked in that fridge and I look in another fridge and I look in another fridge. And everywhere I look, there's light. So because it, and because it's so quick to check, I start to think, well, oh, this is all nonsense. There's light everywhere. But there isn't light everywhere. It's just that as soon as I open the fridge, the light comes on. And that's like the, the visual world or the world of our own minds. Um, if, I, if I ask myself a question about it, ping, there's the answer. So I think, oh, wow, um, I didn't make that up. It was, it was there all along. But what is actually happening is the light is being um, generated at the very moment I need it. This one's interesting. It makes me think of... I have a friend named Gary. He was a past guest as well. And he has a really good sense of people's feelings and what's going on in the interaction. So many times 
I didn't have a good sense of the whole interaction. Then he described it, and right after that, it seemed super obvious, like, oh, okay, I get it all. But I made clear when I would point it out to him or myself, I had no clue until he, once he illuminated it, described it, I'm like, oh, okay, now everything is just obvious. Before he said it, I had no clue. If you left me an hour, I still wouldn't have had a clue. So there yeah, is that, like, yeah. it fills in the gap. One thing related to this is, can we as people, is multitasking even a worthwhile thing? Do we even mm. do that? Yeah, I think multitasking is pr largely a myth. Um, so another of the amazing things um, that you get in, in the psychology of attention um, is that we are really, really bad at doing more than one thing at a time. Now, there are certain things we can do, which are done by very basic bits of the brain. So we can certainly, our heart keeps on going. That's all good. We can do that and we can do other things. That We can keep our breathing going. We can keep our balance reasonably well. In fact, that's not always true with balance. So if you... Um, if you have to do something standing on one leg, um, that actually does that does impair you cognitively. It'll slow you down. You won't be able to you know, add up numbers quite as quickly, and so on. Because yeah, you, you know, unless you're very good at it, if you practice, if you're a very practice practice gymnast, that will be fine. But if you're not, then that will that will take up some resources. Um, but um, but for things that involve um, reasonable levels of cognitive complexity, or at least aren't, aren't done by special brain systems. Um, then the brain is, is, is essentially only, only, only able to do one thing at a time. Now, there's a good reason for this. And the reason is that the, the brain works in a, complete, in a very distributed way. So if I'm, for example, um, represent, trying to recognize, I don't know, a particular object. So I look over in, a, in, in the far corner of my kitchen is a bowl. So if I try to recognize that bowl, then... I'm going to take all the different scraps of information about that bowl and try and piece them together. And I've got to then search around my memories to, re to recognize that it, that it is a bowl. I've got to, to connect it to other bowls I've seen. I've probably got to connect it to the word bowl and so on. So there's an awful lot of searching around. And so this involves searching across a huge densely connected neural network to solve this problem, where I'm comparing, fishing out lots of past memories and piecing together lots of bits of information. And if you try and do that on two problems at once with the same network, you're going to get lots of interference. So you're going to get the signals are going to get sort of mushed up and mixed together. So you need to have one, basically it's one network for one problem. Now that means that if, if you can find, if you have a task where there's a special purpose network, which just does that one thing, then you're, you're all good. Um, but for most things we do, that's not the case. So most things we do require a, right, a range of different, um, uh, fairly flexible systems to be deployed. And that will screw up any other task you try to do because they also require the same, you know, some overlapping set of systems. Um, so really, I think we're, if anything reasonably complicated, we can basically only do one thing at a time. And 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 you can you can sort of demonstrate, um, you know, the, the you can you can demonstrate this in lots of psychological experiments where as soon as you try and give someone more than one thing to do, they usually collapse, you know, pretty pretty hopelessly. I mean, it's just you know, really really difficult. Um, but but. If, so, so, for example, let me give you one, one very somewhat counterintuitive example of that, which is um, if you have two different channels in your uh, left and your right ear, which are voices, so they're just voices saying words, um, then you really can't attend to one. You can attend to one channel or you can attend to the other channel, but you really can't attend to both. So if, for example, you have to repeat one channel or, or in other ways pay attention to it, then if the other channel starts changes from being a man to a woman you may not even notice that right it's really weird so i'm listening listening and i have to repeat a set of numbers say in my right ear in my left ear there's some just a, a list of words and the speaker in many cases can change gender um and if, if i then pay attention again i can think hang on that was that was that was a man a moment ago now it's a woman that's weird but but as things were going along i'm just completely oblivious to that so i i, you know, I can't even pay attention to two things at once now if you're if you're in a crowded room you, you're exactly in this position so when you're listening if you find yourself listening to somebody else's conversation for a moment you suddenly think oh god i have no idea what that what the person in front of me just said because i just my comp my um my attention was just grabbed by that other person's um, speech. Or if mm -hmm. I, you know, I suddenly found myself you know, attending to the TV, oh, help, where, where were we? Um, but, but we can fool ourselves a bit. I think the re and the reason we can fool ourselves is we can, we can hop from one task backwards and forwards quite quickly. So we can have the sense, particularly if neither, neither task is very demanding, we can have the sense that we can do more than one thing at a time. So we can have the sense while, while driving along and having a conversation on a mobile, a hands-free mobile phone, we can have the feeling that 
I'm concentrating completely on the road and I'm having this conversation and it's all good. I'm just you know, completely, completely just doing these in parallel. But that's, a, that's wrong. Um, and in fact, you, you really aren't. You're, you're jumping from one task to the next, but you're doing it quickly and fluently. Uh, but, but nonetheless, quite dangerously. So hands-free hands -free mobiles are actually, you know, they do quite strongly raise your risks of accidents and they quite strongly impede your driving ability. Um, but of course, most of the time, nothing's happening on the road. So you can just, you, know, you can you can switch, switch back and forwards and you know, nothing's happened. And so you can have the feeling that you're in good shape. But in fact, you're you're sort of zoning out quite a, quite a fundamental way when you're you're concentrating even though it's a different modality. So even, so again, we can have the sense that, well, one's a, one's a listening task and one's mm -hmm. a visual task. Oh, that can't be, there can't be any interference there. But that's also actually surprisingly, surprisingly misleading. Yeah. Mm. So yes, watch out, everybody. Yes, <laughs> just be careful. <laughs> that's pretty good. One thing I noticed, there was one chapter section that was about inventing feelings. How much of feelings are invented similar to the visual perception we take in automatically? How much of it is just generated? Yeah, I think um, I think we're pretty much entirely inventing our feelings, but not from nothing. So they're not they're not totally fictitious. They're um, but they are in matters of interpretation. So the thought here is that if something if something scary happens, or there's a loud bang, then I will get a shot of adrenaline will go through my body and that's happening before I'm consciously aware of anything and then I will think where did that shot of adrenaline come from this is going back to in fact William James one of the founders of psychology had this this insight this 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 uh, shot of adrenaline has got to be explained and I think I know what that was that was that loud noise or that was that something scary uh, I, I must be scared now I may also get a shot of adrenaline for other reasons um, and so that may be interpreted in different ways. So the very same physiological stimulus can make me feel um, may make me feel either angry or uh, fearful or excited or whatever it may be. So a, fam a very famous um, uh, and very, very nice experiment by Dutton and, um, and Aaron, which is in, in the book, going back to 1974, so it's done at the University of British Columbia, is an experiment where you um, people walk across a, a, either a high bridge over a creek, a very wobbly um, a rope bridge or a, a low bridge. And male bridge crossers are interviewed by attractive female experimenters at the, at the, end, at the end of each uh, bridge. And they're given a fairly, fairly routine uh, survey. Um, and they're asked at the end whether they would like to have the number of the experimenter because they might, they might have some ethical concerns, for ethical reasons, they had to you know, give them the opportunity to come back with any queries. And, th and there was no reason why they would have any ethical issues, I think, in this experiment. But, but anyway, and what they were monitoring was how many of these uh, male bridge crossers actually asked for the number and indeed how many called the number. And you've got a, a, something like a 50 or 60% uh, increase in the number of calls when the bridge was the high bridge. And... So the clever trick that that Dustin and Aaron were, were tested, were playing here, is they were, is the following: they're thinking, well, if you've just walked across a bridge, you're, you've got a lot of adrenaline because it's a scary bridge. Uh, but then you meet someone and you think, oh wow, I, have, I, just, I seem to have this incredible reaction. I mean, like my, you know, I'm just full of adrenaline. Wow, this must be because this, this, there's some real chemistry with this person. This is totally wrong. <laughs> it's complete fake, complete fake. But that's the, it's, a, it's a mistake. So your, your brain is interpreting the adrenaline mistakenly and then thinking, I must really like this person. I'll take her number and then I'll call her, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll call her the, tomorrow or something. Um, so, so, and this is a very, very general phenomenon. So um, I think we, it's not that our physiological states come from nothing. I mean, they do get kicked around by, um, the people we meet and the bridges we cross and the, uh, the loud noises we hear and so on. But we have to interpret those very, very, really, very crude and basic physiological signals um, to work out what, what, what our emotion is. Um, so, for example, if you think about something like being jealous, um, that's like, you know, physiologically, there's no, there's no signal for being jealous. All you've really got is am I adrenalized or not? Am I sort of feeling lively or not or feeling tired? And there's also a kind of general um, approach, um, positive, you know, go forward and meet the world or like hide um, dimension. So you've got roughly two dimensions, according to at least um, uh, James Russell's uh, Boston University's um, circumplex model, which is a well-known model of, 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 of the basis of emotion. But so you've got a pretty simple physiology. Um, but on top of that, you've got these complicated things like jealousy. And jealousy is, cannot be physiological because it's about specific things you're jealous of, which are obviously 
um, not in the physiology, that things like, oh, wow, they did so much better than me in that test. Oh, it's so annoying. Um, but of course, that, you know, there's no way that's you know, coming out of the, the, the physiology of the body. But it's being, but the fact that you feel that as jealousy, you feel the, react, the physiological reaction of uh, as jealousy, you think, yeah, I'm getting adrenalized because I'm really annoyed about that. And the reason I'm annoyed is because I'm thinking about the, that person getting the better score than me in the test and, and I got this reaction, so I'm really jealous. Um, so you're, you're creating an interpretation of your own emotions. And I think the way to think about that is to think that that's true for interpreting other people too. So when we look at other people, of course, we have to figure out, well, what's happening to them? What, who are they with? What's just happened? What are they looking at? Oh, I, and what expression they've got on their face? Oh, I, I guess they're feeling this. Uh, or if they're feeling annoyed by this person and being slighting them or being jealous or, or you know, making them laugh. Um, and so you interpret a person's emotion using this really you know, complicated uh, improvised, it's an inferential process. And you have to do the same trick with yourself. So the thing I want to stress, and I think this really is a, a pretty, in a way, pretty standard view actually in psychology of emotion, but it's very counterintuitive, is that it, we think of emotions as kind of mysteriously coming up, as it were, from the body. Uh, they just well up, and then there they are. Um, but actually, we have to interpret them and figure them out. But we're such good, good, so good at doing this. The, um, you know, we, we we think of them as just spontaneous happenings within us. I've noticed that it's very useful. Uh, people who want to use it in some sort of practical sense, sales people or people that are uh, you know looking to start relationships or something, they can use these methods to transfer one feeling to another. Yes. And most people are not yes. aware of these things. If they're holding something cold, they don't like someone as much. If they're holding someone warm, they might like them a little bit more, or the atmosphere, or how they felt at that moment. Or there's no. Yeah, many no, I think I think that's right. It's, it's, it is indeed being, worth being uh, aware of from the point of view of being a sort of a, a cautious consumer or cautious being in the world, because the, these tricks can be played on you. And and another uh, slightly different trick that is is used um, too in, in in film and and other arts is that is to to adrenalize you in one way and then flip the thing in the other way. So something um, scary is happening and now it's something's funny is happening or something funny is happening and now it's now it's scary because you've got lots of adrenaline. You've kind of let that adrenaline run. Um, but now, oh my goodness, um, now I'm reinterpreting you know, that, that adrenaline in a, in, a, in a new way. And so, yeah, yeah, but you're, but you're quite right. There is a, um, you know, the, 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 the intuitive cleverness of humanity has not, you know, has exploited these tricks for, for many, uh, many, many decades and centuries. Mm -hmm. I've noticed this a lot. One thing that came to mind, it's in the related to perception. I'm always just been curious about it. If someone closes their eyes for like 20 minutes, are they actually saving a certain amount of energy for those 20 minutes if there's so much processing yeah, by the eyes? Very, very little. Um, it, it, yeah, I don't, I don't know the great detail, the, the, the way the energetics work, but it's really, really remarkable how much of your... Uh, the energy that your brain consumes is really just basic meta metabolic activity. Uh -huh. uh, so even when you're asleep, you save very little energy. Um, I mean, your your body, your whole body for an average person is uh, uh, running on about um, 70 or 80 watts, which is unbelievably little. Right? So in, in the days before LED light bulbs, I mean, the 70 or 80 watts is a kind of reasonably bright light bulb. And that's driving yeah, a person, I mean, like a whole person. It's incredible. Um, and, and something like 20 or 25 watts is going to be your brain. So it's this unbelievably um, super energy efficient thing, but actually almost that's almost uncorrelated, not completely, but almost uncorrelated with with brain act, uh, the amount of, your, of, act, of activity your brain's engaged in. Now it certainly is true that if you are thinking about a specific problem, so for example, if you're thinking about um, you're trying to you're reading or you're thinking about a math problem or something, um, then there will be particular parts of the brain will be act, a little bit more active than they normally are. So it is true, that you, and that's what, of course, brain imaging can pick up on. So you can say, ah, look, um, you know, the, um, I don't know, the, um, it's what, what the word form area is just a little more active than normal, because if you're reading, that's, that would explain it. But these effects are really teeny. I mean, it's a miracle of science that it's possible to see them at all. But it's not the case that there's some sort of massive, um, you know, sort of machinery is being powered up and ground into action. Um, no, I mean, it's, 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 it's astonishing. The... The brain, the brain really is um, using more or less the same power, you know, all day and all night. That's pretty cool to know. Now I have a better sense of that. Uh, as far as the book and your general research, what, how would you summarize, if you could, if there was like a megaphone to say to all 7.7 .7 billion people on the earth, um, mm -hmm. the message about the brain and or what you would want people to know about it? 
Yeah, I think the the summary message I think would is it would be the following. It would be you are creating your own um, narrative. You're creating your own understanding of the world as you're going along, and be kind to yourself for this reason. It, because it's not that the fact that we are confused and somewhat incoherent, and we don't always um, stick to the same plan, think the same way. We sometimes say things and think, "Oh God, I didn't really mean that." Help that you know. Don't be too harsh on yourself. We're always doing that. That's that's the ba basic nature of humanity, um, and also. Because we're always basing our new thoughts based on our old thoughts, um, so we're not starting from scratch, um, that means that each of us is unique via our history. So, you know, we can always, we can sometimes think, oh, how, I mean, maybe I'm just a bit like other people, or, you know, there's just a few dimensions of variation from one person to the next, uh, different personality traits, whatever. And I think that's really the wrong way to think. I mean, we, each of us is like this amazing, unique coral reef, where the coral reef is built out of not polyps of coral, but the experiences and um, past uh, past improvised improvisations we've we've done. So the fact that people feel very different is because they simply have different histories, and we have you know we when you meet someone you haven't met for for ten or twenty years, you immediately see oh wow they speak like this they move like that and all of these things, and they, the, the individuality we all have is built up in la layer after layer of, of improvisation. So we're all of us much more remarkable and unique and different from each other than we. That we tend to realize we are you know, really you know, human beings are astounding things now the thing about that coral metaphor is it does imply a, a both a limitation and a huge opportunity for us the limitation is you can't just think well i seem to be this shaped coral i'd just like to be a different shape please can i just make that happen that is a bit like that you know, my, my analogy with this for uh, going back to the sort of artistic world would be it's a bit like listening to charlie parker and thinking Ah, okay. Can I play the sax like that then? Let's just let's just think my way to playing like Charlie Parker. Well, that's not going to happen. I mean, that's you know that's twenty years of work, and still you'll you won't quite get there. But um, but 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 having said that, because because you've built up if you're a, if you you you've built up through your life a, a set of um, skills and, and 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 improvisational abilities, and you have to build with the ones you've got. You can't you can't magic others into existence. Um, so if you're if you're playing you're playing saxophone you know, very differently from Charlie Parker, which almost everybody will be, um, you can't just magically turn yourself into into a different person. Of course not. But on the other hand, by methodical, slow, um, effortful, piece by piece um, work, you can actually play a bit more like Charlie Parker because you can you know, copy a little bit of what he does, and then you can do a little bit, little bit more, and a little bit more, and you won't. You know, but you'll still be you. You'll still be you, and you'll be using your own you know, uniqueness and your unique way you play. But you can you can actively grow yourself or push you, know, encourage yourself to go in one direction rather than another. So rather than thinking, I think the the, the, the mental depth perspective can make you think. I'm kind of controlled from some mysterious machine inside me or some psychic forces inside me. I don't understand and I can't change. And I think this more a coral like metaphor says, well, yeah, it's true. You are the history you are, you have does mean you are, you're you, you're not someone else. Um, and you can't magically just become someone else. But if you want to change some aspect of your behavior or thinking, you know, sometimes that is possible by slow degrees, and you know we do we do direct our own lives. We do we are authors of our own destiny, within restrictions. So I think there's you know we should we should be kind to ourselves. We're amazing. The hu human um, cre creativity is astonishing. Each of us is much more creative and much more unique than we realise, and we have a little bit of control over our own mental destiny. Mm. I like that message. It's very inspirational in a way. Professor Nick Chater, I would like to thank you for having been on episode number 236 of the show about this book and related concepts. It was great to have you on. Great. Well, thank you so much, Alvin, for the opportunity. You know it. And we are out.